Alarm Clock on the Night Table by Zoran Zivkovic. Miss Margarita's eyes popped wide open. She realized instantly that something was wrong. Lying in bed, she tried to figure out what had given her this impression. She couldn't remember dreaming, and that was odd because she always had dreams. Then she realized what was wrong. She was surrounded by silence. Turning towards the night table, she looked wearily at the round old alarm clock with its two dome-shaped bells. It had been sitting there for more than half a century. She'd become used to its ticking and now could not fall asleep without it. Once a year, when she took it to the watchmaker to be cleaned, she would sometimes lie awake in bed all night. Miss Margarita used the clock to fall asleep, not to wake up. She had never once set the alarm. There was no need. She was one of those rare individuals with a reliable internal clock, able to wake up at a precisely set time. The night before, she had set her internal clock for 7.30. There was no way she could have failed to do this, for it was an invariable part of her preparations for sleep. After coming out of the bathroom, she would bring a glass of water from the kitchen. Then she would read in bed for about a quarter of an hour, always from the same book, a slim collection of love poems that had been with her as long as the clock. Finally, after turning out the light, she would simply wish to wake up at the usual time. All that was left was to close her eyes and surrender to the ticking of the clock. The clock hands were now standing in a position that could not be correct. 12.07. She reached for her glasses. After putting them on, she saw more clearly. The clock had evidently stopped right after midnight. She would take it to the watchmakers straight after breakfast. This would disrupt her day, but what choice did she have? She led an orderly life, and postponing or neglecting her duties filled her with unease. But this was an emergency. The thought of the clock standing broken on the night table with her doing nothing to fix it would upset her even more. She had a quick breakfast. She knew her sensitive stomach might complain, but she couldn't eat any more slowly. It didn't take her long to get dressed, either. She had two dresses for outings during the summer. She wore the less formal one to do the shopping and take her afternoon walk in the park, while she kept the other one for rare special occasions such as this. The greatest amount of time was spent putting on her little black hat with its lace veil. Before, when her hair was still luxuriant, she had put her hat in place with ease, but her hair had thinned with the years, making it harder and harder. Finally, she dabbed on some perfume. Then, fearing that was not enough, she dabbed on a bit more. Outside, she was greeted by a bright summer morning. Smiling, she headed for the watchmaker's shop. She had gone about one-third of the way when she was struck once again by the feeling that something was wrong. She stopped and stared intently ahead. Then she turned her head around slowly and looked behind her. One glance was enough to confirm that not a living soul was anywhere to be seen. Strange. She went to the grocery store every day and always met someone along the way, even in the worst weather. That was her entire social life. Since she had no friends to visit or to come and visit her, the only chance she had of talking to anybody was when she ran across acquaintances from the neighbourhood each morning. Her conversations in the street were not particularly profound, but she always felt satisfied and fulfilled afterwards, and the solitude of the rest of the day was easier to bear. Why wasn't there anyone about? She mulled it over briefly but could find no explanation. She finally shrugged her shoulders. Maybe the watchmaker would be able to tell her what was going on, but he would probably think her a senile old woman when she asked. The best thing, actually, would be not to mention it. 
Was it all that important whether there were people in the street or not? This way was even better, as though the beauty of the day belonged to her alone. When she was almost there, she realized there was something missing in this beauty. The row of chestnut trees along the street was usually full of birds. Now only the breeze could be heard in the treetops. Where had they all gone? There was no time to dwell on this matter, however, because another, more important one prevailed. What if the watchmaker wasn't there? Who would repair her clock? There was a sharp jangling of bells when Miss Margarita opened the door. She glanced towards the counter and let out a sigh of relief when she saw the hunched figure of the watchmaker. He was engrossed in a repair job. He removed a magnifying glass, smiled and stood up. Hello, Miss Margarita. Hello, she replied cheerfully and headed towards the counter. As she slowly made her way, she noticed a change on the side walls of the little shop. She remembered quite well from earlier visits that there had been two identical grandfather clocks in mahogany cases. Now both walls were covered with alarm clocks. They came in all shapes, sizes and colours, from elegant to ugly, from ornate to plain. And then she noticed that the clocks weren't working. But if they had, no one would have been able to stand such noise for very long. When she reached the counter, Miss Margarita took the alarm clock wrapped in white flannel out of her shoulder bag. It's broken, she said dejectedly. The watchmaker started to unwrap the bundle. He was a small, thin man with long side whiskers and a high forehead. It was hard to determine his age. Miss Margarita had concluded long ago that he was one of those people practically untouched by age. Is it slow again, like last time? No, it stopped. Completely? he asked in surprise. Yes, last night, right after midnight. I hope it's nothing serious. The watchmaker made a cursory examination of the clock. She tried to figure out the diagnosis by the expression on his face, but it remained completely blank. I'll have to open it up, he said at last. Please take a seat, it might take some time. Miss Margarita nodded and went to sit down. She would have been just as obedient if she'd been asked to leave the operating theatre and wait while they operated on someone very close to her. The silence of the multitude of clocks started to weigh her down. Although she detested noise, she now felt it would be easier to stand if they were working. It would be confirmation that time was flowing. This way, it seemed as though the operation on her clock could last an eternity. The watchmaker slowly took the magnifying glass off his left eye. He got up, took the clock from the workbench, and approached Miss Margarita. I'm afraid there's nothing to be done, he said. Here, see for yourself. The back cover was off, revealing a tangle of tiny gears, springs, levers, screws and pins. Her eyes remained only briefly on these mechanical entrails, for she quickly turned her head aside. She was overcome by nausea. The watchmaker had already started to explain. These two gears here are broken. They're worn out. Unfortunately, they are highly important. You might say they are the heart of the clock. And nothing can work without a heart. Isn't that so? If this were a newer model, it would be easy to replace them, but... No one makes spare parts any more for such old models. He turned to look at the silent clocks. These could have kept time and woken people up if only there had been parts for them. But I don't need a clock to wake me up. She'd thought she would never reveal her secret to the watchmaker. But now she had no choice. He looked at her, puzzled. What else could an alarm clock be used for? She did not reply at once. She felt ill at ease. To fall asleep, she answered at last. I can't fall asleep without its ticking.
Then maybe you should think about buying a new one. I will be happy to buy your old alarm clock, so a new one won't cost very much. As you can see, I collect them. No, said Miss Margarita, almost screaming. I won't sell it. And then, ashamed of such a violent outburst, she hurried to add, It's a memento, you know, a, a, a very dear one from... The sentence was left unfinished. But the watchmaker nodded. I understand. Please, let me take another look at it. Maybe something can be done if all you want is for it to tick. This time the wait seemed different to Miss Margarita. Her previous apprehension was replaced by impatience. She felt naked before the watchmaker and wanted this to end as soon as possible. Whatever the result of his attempts, she would no longer have any reason to go to this shop. From the smile on the watchmaker's face as he returned, she understood she had nothing to fear. You are in luck, he said. From now on, your clock will tick if you wind it regularly. He started to wrap it up in the flannel cloth. That part of the mechanism shouldn't wear out for quite some time. Here you are. Thank you, she said, taking the wrapped clock. As she put it in her bag, she could hear the soft ticking. How much do I owe you? Goodness, nothing was such a small thing. Please, I insist. Miss Margarita, I doubt whether you will be needing my services any more. Consider this a small farewell present. She had never liked people to give her services free of charge. If she were to insist on paying, however, the watchmaker might take offence, and this was certainly something she wanted to avoid, particularly if this truly was, as he felt, their last meeting. Thank you once again. I shall remain in your debt. The watchmaker bowed. Farewell, Miss Margarita. She turned and headed for the door, just a few minutes earlier, she'd wanted never to come here again, and now she hoped he was wrong. Suddenly it became important for this not to be her last visit to the watchmaker. When she went out in the street, her first thought was that her eyesight had blurred for some reason. The world that had seemed perfectly clear before had now become completely opaque. Wrapped in greyness that made it impossible to see even the pavement on which she was standing, she seemed to be floating in mid-air. She thought about going back inside, but then she would be faced with having to explain and would only become hopelessly muddled. No, she would head home. Where else would she find refuge on such an unusual day but in her house? It wouldn't be easy, but luckily all she had to do was move straight ahead. There were no turns. She would use the row of chestnuts as her guide. It took great strength of will to leave the shop entrance and walk into the mist. Somewhere from the edge of oblivion flashed a memory from her childhood when she was learning how to swim. Then she had been forced to overcome tremendous internal resistance to leave the shelter of the shore and venture out into deep water. She went slowly down the street, holding one arm out in front like a blind person holding a white stick. She soon felt dizzy from staring into the unchanging whiteness. After the seventeenth step, when she almost crashed into the second chestnut, the relief she felt rivaled that of a castaway thrown fortuitously onto land by a storm. This feeble encouragement soon evaporated, however, when she realized that she would not be able to tell when she reached home. She didn't know how many trees there were between her home and the watchmaker's shop. She continued her slow steps. Right now, it was important to advance in the right direction. Her hampered eyesight sharpened her hearing. She was between the sixth and seventh chestnut when she heard soft voices coming from somewhere in the mist. They seemed to be coming from the treetops, as though the birds had returned and were now chirping with human voices. She pricked up her ears and finally started to make out the words. They were disconnected parts of conversations. There were men's, women's, and children's voices, old and young. The fragments were not long. They started in the middle of a sentence and then suddenly ended. 
Sometimes laughter would resound. Much less frequently, the conversation was serious and gloomy, and one was even filled with quiet crying. Most of the voices sounded familiar, but hard as she tried, she could not call to mind the faces of those who were talking. This filled her with frustration. Her memory had recently started to fail her like this. She would be on the verge of grasping something, and then it would be maliciously whisked away. Then she noticed a common characteristic. There was a female voice in every fragment, old, coughing, sometimes defiant. This was the moment of truth. She might still not have recognized her own voice were it not for the defiance that was her manner of confronting the world. As though someone had pulled the veil from her memory, suddenly there were no more secrets. Regardless of how brief the fragment, she knew unfailingly when it was, where, and to whom she was talking. Her life stood before her, as clear as an open book, intermittently underlined. Making her way through the endlessly thick mist, she wondered whether the lines she heard were highlighted merely at random or with some purpose in mind. It seemed to her as if someone had noted down parts of her life without rhyme or reason, or else she was unable to detect any. She was just about to stop searching when she noted a new pattern. Each fragment was farther back in time than the one before. The farther she got from the watchmaker's shop, the deeper she retreated into the past. Her voice became gradually younger and softer. It wasn't hard for her to imagine the increasingly younger face that went along with it. Her wrinkles smoothed out. The loose skin hanging sadly under her chin disappeared. The spots on her cheeks vanished. Most of those she now heard herself talking to were no longer among the living. She had outlived them all. She ascribed this primarily to her orderly lifestyle. She knew that the most dissolute among them secretly made fun of her self-discipline and moderation, but she had been the one in a position to laugh last. She had never done this, however. She had been defiant and stubborn, yes, indeed, but not malicious. The loss of each one had been hard for her. Tears came to her eyes even now as she heard their long, silent voices return. The closer she got to her younger years, the greater became her apprehension. It had taken a lot of effort to block out the incident that had shaped the rest of her life. She had no way of knowing how these audible fragments from her past would treat the incident, but she felt certain they could not ignore it. Her anxieties came true, but not as she had feared. Judging by the number of chestnut trees she'd counted, she must have already been close to home when the noise in the treetops suddenly ceased. Then she heard a soft sound somewhere behind her. It was repeated at regular intervals, becoming stronger. She didn't recognize it until it was almost upon her. Someone was walking down the street. Judging by the spryness of the steps, it must have been a younger man who did not seem the least bothered by the mist. Like the beam of a reflector sliding through the darkness, a clear oval bubble was making its way through the mist. The young man inside was tall and slender, his face had firm, regular features that were handsome in their accentuated masculinity. The officer's dress uniform fitted him perfectly. In his left hand were two small packages wrapped in brightly colored paper and tied with red ribbons. One was flat, the other square. Miss Marguerita's breath failed her. She opened her mouth and made every effort to breathe deeply, but her heart began to pound frantically. She snapped out of it when the greyness surrounded her once again. She took after the oval almost at a run. The doctor had strictly forbidden such efforts, but that made no difference to her now. It was the safest way to reach home. The young man would take her there without fail. When he took off his cap and rang the bell, 
Miss Margarita was standing hesitantly about halfway up the walk. She knew who would open the door to him, but it seemed somehow inappropriate to look at that person. In addition, she was still very angry with her. After all these years, she still could not forgive her for what she had done. The door opened. For just a moment, she caught sight of the hem of a light yellow dress fluttering in the draught. She still had it, but kept it out of sight, so as not to awaken painful memories. The closed door did not prevent Miss Margarita from seeing what was happening inside. She accepted the two little packages with delight. She had always loved presents. She untied the ribbon on the flat package first. Smiling broadly, she went up on her tiptoes and lightly touched the young man's lips with hers in thanks. It was just a hint of a kiss, but their intimacy had not yet gone any farther. The deluxe edition of the poems looked magnificent. She'd wanted it so much. She couldn't imagine what was in the other package. Her patience got the better of her as usual. She quickly raised the lid of the square purple box and looked inside inquisitively. Her smile instantly disappeared. She stood there for several moments, staring at him without a word and then did what the sharp voice of her defiant, proud nature commanded. She roughly put everything she was holding into his hands, turned, and quickly walked out of the parlour. She almost slammed the bedroom door behind her. How could he have done such a thing? After everything that had happened, the alarm clock was not only an insult, but an injury. Two days earlier, while they were out walking, why had she mentioned her ability to wake up whenever she wanted without any outside help? She'd exposed herself to someone who was unworthy of it. He just laughed, said that no one could do something like that, and then he'd added in a playful voice that he might believe her if he had the chance to see for himself. She hadn't immediately understood the full meaning of his words. When it finally dawned on her that seeing her ability for himself meant waking up in the same bed, she turned on her heel in anger and quickly walked away. Who did he think she was? Why, they weren't even engaged yet. He ran after her, started to apologize, but it was not until they were near her house that she spoke to him, her voice cold and official. She told him that she never wanted to see him again. Never. Her anger lasted all through the evening, but softened the next morning. That was also part of her nature. Remorse was the flip side of her defiance. By noon, she had already shifted the blame to herself for being so hard on him. She could have gone looking for him and explained that never was not quite as final as it might appear, but that, of course, was out of the question. Her pride would not let her regret go quite that far. The next morning, he'd come to the front door in the dress uniform he'd been wearing when she first set eyes on him four and a half months before and fell immediately in love. She could barely stop herself from falling into his arms right then and there on the doorstep. Only a few minutes later, however, had come the terrible slap with the alarm clock. Leaning against the bedroom door, she did not even try to hold back her sobs. This time never would be absolute and irrevocable. The only thing she wanted was for him to leave, to disappear from her parlour and her life. And he had left, the parlour and her life. First, he'd put the opened presents he brought on the table. He certainly couldn't take them where he would soon be heading. He thought briefly about knocking on the bedroom door and telling her that in less than three hours he would board a train that would take him straight to the front. But he hadn't knocked. He already knew her quite well. He turned slowly around the room as though wanting to fix it in his memory. Then he put his cap back on and went out. The oval bubble was waiting in readiness to clear his path through the mist that he didn't see just as he didn't see the tiny, stooped old woman that he almost brushed against.
If he had been able to hear through the chasm of time that separated them, her sobs would seem strangely familiar to him. Miss Margarita went straight to the bedroom. That was where she kept a chest full of mementos. Among these old things was a wilted piece of paper. She slowly started to read the four lines typed on it, although, just like the book of poems, she had learned them by heart long ago. This text was not the least bit lyrical. She had received it only three days after leaving him in the parlour. She was not related to him, but her name had nonetheless been on the list of those to be informed in case of his death. The officer who had brought the news added awkwardly that there had been no funeral. The general slaughter at the front offered little opportunity for that. She put the telegram back and closed the chest. She stood next to it for several minutes, not knowing what else to do. What time of the day was it? This reminded her of the alarm clock in her bag. It unfortunately could not help her find out the time because it no longer worked. She would have to buy a conventional one. She didn't care very much about knowing the exact time, but one could not live without a clock after all. She took it out of her bag and put it on the night table. It ticked steadily, as though still measuring something. She stared at it blankly. She stayed like that until she felt the repetitive sound starting to have an effect on her. Maybe she would have a little rest. She would just lie on the bedspread. She never slept during the day. But what difference did it make? There was no one to see her. She closed her eyes. Before she sank into the deep darkness and silence, two thoughts briefly crossed her mind. She was somehow convinced that she wouldn't have any dreams. That was good. She would have the best rest that way. In addition, this time there was no need to set her internal clock. She had no reason to wake up at any specific hour. No urgent work awaited her anymore.